nanohub.org. Online simulation and more for nanotechnology. What are the most critical grand challenges that humanity is facing today? And what are the best scientific tools to address these challenges? These are the questions that I ask myself to motivate me for my work using nanoengineering and thermal fluids for the water food energy nexus. So let's look at the global preventable causes of death. And this includes causes that are, with the proper resource allocation, easily preventable. It would exclude things like cancer or things that are fairly innate with humans. Unsafe water contributes about 3 million deaths per year, and hunger and nutrition is about 8 million deaths. These areas all comprise, combined with indoor air pollution and climate change impacts, areas directly caused by the, in, in the water food energy nexus, or challenges that could be addressed with improvements in this area. And it's not just a large moral motivation and moral issue, it's also an economic one. In 2015, the World Economic Forum named a water crisis the most likely and most impa impactful economic risk. So, what is the water energy food nexus? Well, simply put, the inputs for each water, food, and energy, and the outputs are highly interrelated. They're very interdependent. About 70% of water is consumed um, by food production. Uh, food production produces a lot of waste and contaminants that have to be removed. And both processes are energy intensive and also have roles as in inputs for energy, either through biofuels or um, energy resource extraction and cooling water. What this looks like is a large variety of small-scale challenges, such as pathogens or small contaminants, membranes and small processes, uh, as well as large-scale system-level challenges, uh, better designed for uh, large-scale cycles, uh, small-scale um, heat transfer improvements, um, large-scale system design, and both large and small-scale contamination and pollution challenges. So to address these, this small and large nature of the water food energy nexus, we can look at nanoengineering approaches that are guided by larger scale or thermal fluids processes. So, we need to provide more water. Well, we can do this on the supply side or the demand side. On the supply side, we have desalination and we have reuse of wastewater and sewage water, which happens to need de desalination membranes. We also have a variety of options to reduce the demand for water. We can use water more efficiently, and then we have some less savory options. Reducing population, no thank you. Reducing the size of economy, probably not a good political move. And relocating people, no thanks either. So in this talk and in my work, I'm focusing on increasing the water supply. And my talk is overall heavily focused on water with some aspects related to energy and food as well. So water research has had a growing research in academia where the publications per year are growing at an astounding rate, 13% and 32% um, for energy and water and desalination. And the market growth has actually also been very rapid. Um, the desalination market globally is growing around 14%. And the potable water reuse market using desalination membranes is growing even faster. In contrast, global electricity production is growing uh, by 2050 only around 2% annual rate. So these are looking at very, very rapid levels of growth. There's also been increased US government interest in terms of funding sources. Um, so one example of this is the new $72 million NSF uh, Infuse program, which is focused on highly interdisciplinary collaborative grants focusing on the food, energy, and water nexus. Sorry, this number is average This is per year. Per year, but over the oh. last five years, years? So uh, it varies, but most of these are the last five, current growth calculated over the last five years. Uh, whereas this one is a number that's averaged over the next um, 30 or 40. Um, but yeah, these are, these are current rates. Um, there's also been heavy interest from uh, journals, from the journal, the publishers for research. So in the last year, both the Royal Society and Nature have produced two new water journals to compete for the most prestigious venue for water research. So it's a, it's a hot topic. Um, in this area, we have a variety of research techniques which are relevant for water um, using thermo and nano techniques. And these are techniques I specifically cover in my work. So, and we kind of have a blend of a spectrum between 
more fundamental thermodynamic designs, and then on the nanomaterial side and how they integrate together. And this includes optimization, transport phenomena, um, anti-fouling challenges, uh, surface fabrication, etc. So my research breaks out a few of these different categories, and it's kind of a mix of nanoengineering and thermal fluids. And we won't have time to go through everything or even very much of it today. But you can kind of divide it into both thermal fluids and nanoengineering, but really there's a lot of overlap between these categories. In this talk, I'm going to focus on condensing surfaces uh, for membrane distillation using superhydrophobic jumping droplet condensation, and then briefly point out a subset of some of the other applications of thermoengineering and nanoengineering approaches for water and energy and food. This is going to cover thermally powered desalination, electric powered desalination, and energy for food. Doing th looking at this through membrane distillation, reverse osmosis, and food refrigeration as the examples to illustrate these overall broader categories. So, what is desalination? What are the fundamentals? Simply put, in desalination, we can imagine some black box or some process where we're taking an input of feed water, and as outputs, we're, we're producing pure water, which we want to consume, and then we're sending the salts and other contaminants that we do not want back to the, the main source as brine. To enact this separation process, we need an energy source. So this can be either an electrically driven process, such as through high pressure pumping or uh, applying charges to move salts, or it can be a thermally driven process where we use evaporation and recondensation to desalinate. There's a few definitions that we need to have a basic understanding for desalination. The first is the recovery ratio, which is simply your fraction of desalination that you're actually enacting. So what is your mass of your flow rate of your permeate, pure permeate water divided by your incoming feed water? The other is the second law efficiency. When we're comparing different processes, both thermal and electrical, it's very helpful to have a unified metric. The second law efficiency compares to essentially what fraction of a perfect process, one example is a Carnot cycle, um, are we achieving? So it's the minimum least work for a process divided by how much work we actually need. So we have these tools. Which desalination technologies do we want to use? Well, here's modeling I've done for the main leading desalination processes. Looking at th thermal processes as well as the leading mechanical processes, and powering them by variable temperature waste heat, which means powering some the mechanical processes through organic Rankine cycles. And we see that reverse osmosis is particularly efficient, and the thermal processes are fairly similar. And they also experience mostly similar trends when using lower temperature waste heat. In this talk, I'm going to focus on reverse osmosis and membrane distillation where memory distillation is the most rapidly growing thermal process and has the potential to be um, the most efficient thermal process, as some of my work has shown. And reverse osmosis is the dominant technology by market share and the most efficient. So looking at a market share between these, reverse osmosis is almost 60%. And memory distillation is one of the many thermal processes which comprises the bulk of the other alternatives. So how are we comparing these types of processes? I'm not going to go into detail, but we can break out how these are designed, and we see that the thermal processes tend to use multiple stages of matched temperature and pressure for uh, boiling and, and good heat transfer. Heat, ex heat exchangers are common components, and um, we either have high-pressure membrane systems, uh, pumping energy, evaporation, recondensation, and lots of heat exchanger work. And these are some similar trends between these systems. And when comparing them, we can also look at component energy, component level uh, entropy generation, and we can kind of f see trends on where the weak points are and identify commonalities between them. So, for instance, we notice at lower temperatures, the top heaters tend to be a much larger source of our losses. So those are going to be components that would take more investment to improve overall performance. So, let's pick, focus on one technology, membrane distillation, which was I br briefly introduced as one of the technologies there. Memory distillation has many advantages. It can scale to, it can be very efficient. It can scale down to smaller sizes than any other thermal process. It gives very, very pure water as a result of the fact that only volatile solutions can pass through this membrane. Uh, and it's very fouling resistant. It's also good for remote applications, let's say village level water treatment, where you want a robust, long lasting system that doesn't need much uh, component replacement because it operates at low pressures and can be relatively lower maintenance than, let's say, reverse osmosis. And there are a variety of companies that are currently pursuing membrane distillation. So what is membrane distillation? 
Simply put, we have a hydrophobic membrane which allows water vapor to pass, but not liquid water. And we apply a temperature gradient to cross this membrane. This causes water vapor to evaporate from one side, traverse through the membrane, and condense on the other side. Now we want to operate this process in an efficient manner. So we designed this as a countercurrent heat exchanger. What this looks like is we have feed entering salty water that gets preheated as it goes to this countercurrent heat exchanger, a top heater to he he increase the top temperature, and a delta T between both sides, which enacts desalination and produces brine and pure water from the system. And when modeling the systems, we have to account for um, heat transfer, mass transfer simultaneously, and typically in computational cells where we use the finite difference method to look at a few hundred of these and balance them to get an entire view of a large system. And so you have boundary layer effects, both in temperature and concentration to account for, diffusion with counter diffusion, um, and a lot of other fundamental uh, heat transfer pieces. I, want, I don't want to go into the details, but it's important to note, to note two dominant driving equations for these processes. The flux through the membrane is a permeability constant times the vapor pressure difference, or related to the temperature difference across the membrane. And the other is the overall thermal efficiency for the process, which is essentially is how the heat transfer through evaporation, or your heat transfer used to desalinate, divided by total heat transfer because we'll have conductive losses across the membrane. And this is a trade-off between these two. We want to improve the membrane flux while minimizing the overall heat transfer um, that is not from um, desalination itself. These typical systems are done in um, film-wise condensation, but we can use novel surfaces to do enhanced condensation to improve their performance. So I've done work with superhydrophobic condensation. And this is a surface with a contact angle of around 165 degrees, where the droplets are very loosely adhered. What you'll see is droplets combine and actually eject from the surface. You can see here, this can happen actually very rapidly. What's happening is you have these droplets that are really loosely adhered. And they combine. And as they combine, there's a reduction in surface area. And that reduction in surface energy, as a result, goes into wobbling through kinetic energy. And that wobbling causes it to eject from the surface and gives you very good heat transfer coefficients, at least five times that of film-wise condensation. So there's a few different um, condensing regimes I found in membrane distillation. I was the first to look at alternatives besides the classical film-wise condensation. We can use hydrophobic surfaces for drop-wise condensation. Um, and then we can also use super hydrophobic uh, surfaces for jumping droplet, very good um, mass transfer condensation. And we can also deal with fully flooded uh, systems for other designs. This work involves experimental setups. Uh, and the classical way to study desalination systems is to use CNC machined plates to create channels for the different uh, flow regimes and give you um, 1D or two-dimensional flow, depending on what you need, in a way that can be very highly controlled. And one clever thing uh, I've done here is look, used a sapphire condensing surface so you can actually see and visualize condensation on, um, that's occurring in the process, because uh, sapphire is a very high thermal conductivity. Uh, compared to, let's say, plastics or glass, it's about two orders of magnitude higher. So, to create these surfaces, um, what these look like is super jagged and very rough and um, hydrophobic surfaces. So, the rough structure makes it, um, enables it to be more water repelling, and a saline coating uh, provides a floral polymer which makes it hydrophobic. And uh, this is done with, in collaboration with uh, Professor Evelyn, Evelyn Wong's group at MIT. And it essentially involves various cleaning steps to really make a clean, pristine process, and then deliberately um, oxidizing the, sur the surface in a self-limiting process um, to create this black, super rough surface that we then uh, coat with a vapor phase deposited fluoro polymer, um, and then bake it to help covalently bond it and remove excess material to enable this really nice, rough, and hydrophobic structure. So we have a lot of different challenges to make super hydrophobic condensing surfaces that really work well, because we're dealing with simultaneous heat transfer, but also de surface degradation. It needs high roughness to enable super hydrophobicity, and a low surface energy compound to enhance that. This also to be very, very thin, both in terms of the um, rough coating, 
the, the rough layer and the very, very thin coating because they can act as a large thermal resistance and reduce the thermal conductivity. So the self-limiting oxide layer is very thin and also copper oxide has a high thermal conductivity, maybe a, a quarter of that or a sixth of that of actual copper. Um, and then the coating is very, very thin and anything that's not covalently bonded is evaporated <laughs> off in the, in the oven baking step. Um, and this has proven robustness for long operation, and because it's a bath process, it's scalable to large sizes. And this is the type of systems that we want to demonstrate for good hydrophobic condensation. And so we can visualize through the sapphire plate different regimes. We see in the hydrophobic phyllic surface, we're actually seeing a lot of plug flow. Uh, and one observation here is that classically these are modeled as fairly perfect uh, film-wise condensation, but in reality, to support a gap of a membrane, you're always going to have a membrane spacer. And so conventionally, you're getting a lot more of uh, water trapping than people conventionally uh, uh, are aware of, and thus a uh, larger detriment to efficiency. When we look at um, using a very thin uh, hydrophobic clear surface, we can see that we have a lot less water in the system, and we get very small, nice droplets um, that are con condensing. So we're having better rejection of water and avoiding it being trapped, which is giving us better thermal resistance. Um, we're also seeing for the superhydrophobic surfaces very, very small droplets, and after taking it, you know, opening things up afterwards, um, water will shed off very easily. So you can wash it once, and all the water will, will come off. Uh, and we can look at how different techniques improve the overall performance. So looking at um, modifying the spacers, turns out to be not very significant, um, but modifying the surfaces actually has a, plays a very large role in improving performance. Um, and what's going on in this process is that we have this gap, so I'm going to kind of go back here a bit, and we want to maximize this temperature difference um, to maximize flux, but we also want to minimize conduction across it. So this air gap is helping us out because it is not very non-conducting, which is why we want to have some air gap, but it also provides a large mass transfer coefficient for air to diffuse, for water vapor to diffuse across this gap to the condensing surface. So the thinner we can make this gap, and the better we can re reject water through these uh, improved surfaces, the r less um, resistance we're going to have to mass transfer, and that's the overall performance we're going to have, uh, improvement we're going to have. Because if we just had this system, and we didn't have this better um, rejection through hydrophobicity, we just get a fully flooded gap, and then we'd have high levels of conduction. And our um, flux might be higher, but our thermal efficiency would, would get worse. So the whole idea here is that we're keeping this high by having maintaining a good air gap size, but having very high mass transfer coefficients so we can have very high flux. So looking at the results from this, from these super hydrophobic condensing surfaces, we see an overall improvement where we're increasing the flux across a variety of conditions. And under more realistic driving temperatures, um, we're having actually a doubling of the overall permeate flux. We're looking at the flux versus um, energy efficiency curve. So this you can think of as a how much membrane area you need, so a capital cost versus an energy investment. Um, we see a very large overall improvement um, from even small changes in the overall mass transfer coefficient. And thus we're dramatically improving the cost and energy efficiency of these systems. And so there are a variety of implications for these improvements. We can improve the efficiency and flux substantially for membrane distillation in particular. Well, can we use these types of surfaces in the other thermal technologies? These are almost 40% of market share, and especially the multi-effect distillation and multi-stage flash, which are the dominant technologies today, don't use such surfaces, but do have um, film-wise condensation as a major resistance. Can these surfaces improve those processes? Good area for future investigation. Can we use more creative um, wicking regimes and other microfluidic techniques to improve memory distillation and other systems. That's also a possibility. Once we're improving these mass transfer coefficients in any of these thermal processes, should we design them overall on a systems level? Should we change relative areas? Should we change number of stages? There's a variety of questions. Next, I wanted to jump into another important area for memory distillation. The other main challenge besides overall system efficiency is membrane fouling. And that is essentially stuff getting on the membrane, which is going to reduce its hydrophobicity, uh, so it can cause leaking and wetting through the hydrophobic membrane, um, and also block the membrane surface. And the main categories are intergranic fouling, particulate fouling, so you can imagine silica as being a common 
uh, challenge. And also uh, biofouling of small organisms. It could be um, from algae, bacteria especially, and even things like fungi for certain processes. And then memory de degradation over time through membrane cracking. To address these types of challenges, we can use specialized coatings on the membrane surface. Um, and one of the best ways to do so is through initiated chemical vapor deposition, where we're depositing a very, very thin layer along the membrane surface. And these processes are, are quite scalable and can be used in large-scale system design. And we're using um, high temperatures to deposit thin films on surfaces. So this is an example of a very nice thin film on silicone. But here, we're going to use it on polymeric membranes. So we, for ICVD, we have a few uh, characteristics we want to uh, improve. The chemistry matters. Sometimes polar molecules are nice to have. Um, and we want safe chemistry. We want to have maximum hydrophobicity. We want it to break down environmentally well. And it has to be stable and have long-term performance. We also want a coating that is very, very thin, especially on membranes. If we have thick layers in any given portion, we'll just block all the pores. So the coating conformality and thickness is very important. So I've looked at using, making these hydrophobic membrane installation membranes super hydrophobic. And you can see a super hydrophobic membrane I've developed versus the traditional uncoated version. And we can see that the, on a SEM level, they look very similar. So the coating it really isn't impairing the overall performance. I also tested the permeability was almost the same between the two. So it's a very good, good nice conformal coating. One thing you'll see is when you submerge a membrane like this, you actually see a shiny layer on the surface because it's effectively an air layer coating the membrane surface. All right. Now, we've seen the use of air layers in other technologies. Are there advantages of using super hydrophobic membranes and air layers to improve overall performance of these systems? And so the idea here is, if we have a super hydrophobic membrane, can we prevent membrane wetting? And membrane wetting is where you lose the super hydrophobicity um, due to phalanx in the bulk permeating through the membrane and reducing the content angle below 90 degrees, at which point you get very, very rapid leaking through the membrane and your process is ruined. It's the worst failure mode. So if we have an air bubble on the surface, we can have um, essentially no phalanx visible on the membrane uh, and thus be able to block fouling from adhering and dramatically improve the lifetime of the membrane and also the type of solutions it can treat. And the setup looked at a setup I used was a bubbling. Um, so looking at using both a mesh to trap um, bubbles and surface hydrophobicity in combinations of injecting the air in different ways and looking at a variety of membranes with uh, notably the hydrophobic version was 153 degrees for the contact angle. And we see that if we look at, let's say, um, Cassie Baxter wetting phenomenon, if we had a surface that was more covered with air, we would get much higher liquid entry pressures, because, um, which is the amount of pressure it would take to overcome uh, the hydrophobicity and force water through, um, based off of the air fraction on the membrane. So we're seeing just by having higher air fractions, it's much harder for wetting to occur. And um, I examined a variety of different uh, conditions for maximizing um, how much we can avoid wetting based off the concentration of the surfactant SDS. And looked at adding air versus uh, using spacer to trap additional air, and found that for a super hydrophobic membrane with both a spacer um, and air addition, essentially even at very, very high levels of surfactant, we have experienced no wetting. Uh, and this provides a promising way for any application of membrane distillation to improve the overall performance through surface coatings and air introduction. And this is uh, patent pending uh, right now. We also found that the fouling in another study was reduced significantly. So looking at uh, fouling of alginate gels, which is a common biological fouling proxy, we found that between the non-air recharging and air recharging cases, about a 96% reduction in fouling to adhere to the membrane surface. We can also use this type of idea of using air layers um, to reverse wetting. So if we classically, when wetting does occur for these membranes, the main way to address it is you simply dry out the membrane. And the problem is you have a salty, nasty solution that you're drying out inside a membrane. It's going to leave all the solutes behind, which will leave a new path for wetting to occur afterwards. So if instead we inject air from the backside whenever wetting occurs, or periodically, we can reverse wetting in a way that keeps any air from being trapped. And we found that the results were very good comparing forced air to the dry out, or essentially the liquid entry pressure recovery was very good with salty solutions compared to the dry out case, which especially for more saline solutions, had very poor recovery.
and did this in a, another test setup with a small membrane selection section. So next I want to talk about another technology. I covered thermal innovations for thermal processes through looking at membrane distillation. And now I want to talk at, about reverse osmosis. And this is an electrically powered desalination process and the market leader in because of both its energy efficiency and overall low cost. Reverse osmosis is the technology that people are classically most familiar with when we think about... Quick question. Sure. The results you showed for hydrophobic and superhydrophobic, uh, were they at the same temperature in terms of the air layer development, particularly the photographs you showed about eight or ten slides back? Yeah, um, so we did a fair comparison. So um, at the same temperature, it was 50 degrees Celsius for all those trials. Um, yeah, there. Uh, so the 157 versus 125 is an angle. The degrees up top are wetting angle rather than temperature. Oh yeah, this is this is the yeah sorry this is the wetting sorry, angle no. yeah sorry to clarify this is the wetting angle for the two membranes for the hydrophobicity um, the trials run at 50 degrees Celsius uh, once you're getting above 100 degrees Celsius for these systems you have to operate at high pressure so you need pressure vessels mm -hmm. and so these systems are often not run at those high temperatures or atmospheric pressure. typically done at atmospheric pressure which makes this process much cheaper to produce than some others. Mostly an isothermal system, then, or mostly a constant temperature system. Or? Uh, yes, most thermal. Uh, mo in fact, most desalination systems, almost all of them existing today, are constant, um, constant conditions over time. I'm going to talk about how changing that idea mm -hmm. uh, can give you great improvements in efficiency through batch studies. So, I'm going to be covering batch reverse osmosis as my next contribution here. So reverse osmosis is a desalination process where we have a high pressure feed and, we have a, and instead of having a hydrophobic membrane which only allows water vapor to pass through, uh, this is going to be a pressure driven process where it's hydrophilic, water easily passes through, maybe the solutes might get through a little better, um, but it's still a very robust process and we have to exceed the osmotic pressure of the, out, of the outgoing brine in order to have desalination across the whole system here. And so you see I have a feed that concentrates over time across a, a long membrane module and then we get fresh water out and we get brine out that we want to inject back into the environment. And all this work is PDV work. Um, and so excess pressure is a major concern here. So these systems will, in design, be kind of wound up in a large spiral wound system and then we'll have many spiral wound modules, often hundreds of these, in a real desalination plant in order to produce hundreds of thousands of tons of water per day for these larger size systems. So let's look at the energetics for desalinating water this way. Um, we ha it's, a P it's all PDV work. We have to overcome the osmotic pressure. And so the osmotic pressure here represents the least work curve. So if we're looking at the recovery across one long module chain, we start out at zero recovery, and let's say we end around 85%. Over time, our salinity and osmotic pressure are going to increase. And that will represent the least work that is done in the process. We also have um, some terminal overpressure to overcome the membrane permeability. And this will be represented by excess work above the final osmotic pressure. And we can overcome these with ultra-permeable membranes, which I'll talk about in a bit. We also have viscous losses from pressure, which I've shown here. Uh, and over the course of the system, the pressure will be reduced uh, as a result. The pump efficiency is dominant, as is the overall recovery ratio for overall improving efficiency. The nice idea behind using a batch process, which I'll explain momentarily, is that we're going to try to follow, vary the, we're varying the, pre, the applied pressure to follow the least work curve. And so fundamentally, if we had a perfect batch process, we could actually follow the least work for a process over time. So what is a batch process? Well, simply put, like in any chemical engineering process, a batch process is one that varies its, um, it takes a set volume of fluid and performs some chemical separation process over time. In this case, we're increasing the pressure on a set volume of liquid over time and then repeating it over a variety of cycles. So what this will look like is an applied pressure that will ramp up every few minutes and then go back down and repeat over and over again. Compared to the standard processes, which operate at a constant pressure, um, which has some disadvantages because you're applying so much excess overpressure, especially at the very beginning of the system. So let's look at a, a standard reverse osmosis uh, train 
of a high pressure pump that pumps to the that pumps up to the final uh, pressure needed to desalinate the end modules, and have a long chain of modules that recover water in each one. And notably, uh, we have a high pressure stream that's exiting, and we can use additional expensive devices to recover energy from that leaving stream. Now, batch revert concepts have been thought about for a long time because they would be ideal. Um, and in a batch process, we're essentially taking a set volume of fluid and we're increasing the pressure over time and ramping it up and cycling it through with a pump and creating pure water out. Now, the real challenge here is, uh, and after each cycle process, we empty and reject. So the, it's ideally efficient, but how do we make a tank that works for this process? So this tank that's concentrating has to vary its pressure and its volume simultaneously in a fixed manner, reversibly. That is a tricky problem to do, when we want to have tightly controlled pressure to match the current salinity, but also have our volume decreasing over time. So there might be some ideas, but because we have such large volume flow rates, and because these systems are already quite efficient, any type of motor design or springs to recover energy quickly lose all advantage. So no one's been able to implement a batch process um, so far in industry. Well, here's how you can implement a batch process. All right, Def we can look at this tank, and instead of having some type of clever piston design, some clever like motor or powering source, we fill up the void space that we're leaving with the pure water coming out of the system. And, that can, and because water is incompressible, that can give us our control our volume constraint problem. And then we can move our pump and make it in charge of pressurizing that water to fill that void. And so when running this process, we have we shift our volume from all being brine to permeate in a cycle that varies the, con the pressure and concentration over time. What's happening is this whole loop, everything here, is all going to be at one high level pressure, which is increasing over time. But after the membrane, this little piece here is going to be an atmospheric pressure. This lets us do a batch process in a very efficient manner. Um, without the losses, and we're simply only needing a new tank and piston design. And of course, after each process, we have to refill and reject uh, to repeat. It's very efficient. Uh, it does take some innovation to make a tank, but it is all we need is a piston, so it's a very readily uh, accessible idea. To do this type of analysis, again, we have to use um, uh, computational models, uh, where we can imagine we have membrane separation, we have a bunch of discrete volume elements where the fluid is decreasing over time. Uh, and we're balancing the amount of um, salts and water in each different uh, subsection that we divide up. Uh, we, and we solve it in for a simultaneously solved dis discretized uh, cell. Um, compared to the reverse osmosis I showed you before, it's a little more complicated to model. You're summing up over time. Um, it's worth noting that we, have, we still have the pumping losses, um, recovery ratio being an important factor, um, and uh, pumping efficiency being fairly dominant. And we get some interesting trends, including um, so as we get to higher salinities, interesting curves on distance over time and the salinity changing within the system. I'm going to briefly show a graph summarizing these results. So this, this is comparing the second law efficiency modeled for Reverse osmosis, which has brine energy recovery, very efficient brine energy recovery, compared to this new batch design. For seawater conditions, which are typically operated around 35 grams per kilogram, or 3.5% salt by weight, um, and these systems typically have 50%, 50 to 60% water recovery. Uh, we're seeing efficiency improvements on the order of uh, 20 to 23% which is fairly significant, especially given what a large fraction of the overall lifetime costs the energy needs are. Also, the processes which are for lower salinity waters, let's say inland desalination, water reuse, um, uh, groundwater treatment, those tend to be at much lower salinities with very high water recovery. 85% recovery is fairly typical for these processes, and it can be even higher. And we see really tremendous improvements on the overall efficiency, um, on the order of 50 to 60%. Uh, energy savings versus these um, standard systems. So this is a really nice improvement compared to other technologies. And there are a variety of applications. Uh, it can be used for large-scale desalination plants, uh, these types of hundreds of thousands of um, tons of water per day. 
and also agricultural um, water reuse. Um, getting to higher recoveries gives you, and with less energy, especially for these lower recovery ratios, means that the overall costs are going to be lower for water reuse applications. What's also very notable is a major application for reverse osmosis desalination is household level desalination, especially in uh, for now the middle class in places like India and the developing world, they do not have safe water delivery systems. Um, their tap water that they get is highly contaminated. Part of that is due to the fact that their, system, their infrastructure is fairly leaky, and as a result, they're turning these systems off periodically. When you lose the pressure in a piping system, you have flow in the opposite direction, which includes entrainment of sewage water. So you're sending out sewage water to all these places all across India and other, other developing regions. Um, and that's a major problem, and so people who are in the middle class are now buying household level desalination units for a few hundred dollars so that they can have safe, drinkable water with good taste quality in the home. One problem is these very small systems have very low recovery, on the order of 20% being fairly typical. And if you have a problem that you're losing too much water, resulting in these systems being turned off, you don't want everyone only taking 20% of the water out and sending the rest to the sewage system. So if you have a batch type process, you can not only improve the energy efficiency, but you can easily achieve, with very small systems, recovery on the order of 80%. Uh, in fact, we're working on a, essentially a lab scale system right now that is going to be um, essentially the same size as a household system, uh, with the goal of actually being efficient enough to set records for energy efficiency for desalination, even at the lab scale. So this can be a great tool for helping reduce some of these water challenges in the de developing countries. It's also a great application for mining water treatment. Um, one advantage of these batch type processes is because we're varying the salinity over time, you can imagine if you're a little microorganism and your salinity varies by a factor of three every few minutes, it's going to dehydrate those cells. It's not going to be good for it. It can help reduce biofouling, which is one of the major concerns for desalination. Also, because you're going to lower levels of salinity every few minutes, you can, you can go below saturation again, which means you can help redissolve any crystals that have begun to form, so you can go to higher uh, recoveries and higher supersaturations than you could with um, traditional reverse osmosis desalination. So let's look at this from a cost perspective, looking at this case, the large-scale, multi-billion dollar desalination plants, like the new one uh, in San Diego, the Karzlabad desalination plant. Overall, these current systems are split almost in between energy, operating costs, and capital costs. Uh, and we can see that for a batch process, we actually have significant energy savings, uh, significant overall savings. The energy is obviously a very big chunk for these processes, but we're reducing the membrane fouling challenges, which means um, a reduction in the operating costs for membrane replacement and consumables and um, pretreatment technology, such as doping with NaOH, um, to remove um, certain compounds. So you can get some savings in the operating costs. And then in the capital costs, you get a little bit of savings because you need a little bit less pretreatment train. But the real savings is you don't need these large energy recovery systems um, to recover energy from the brine. And this goes back to the fact that um, we have a closed system instead of an open system. You can imagine if we have an open stream of water that's leaving at high pressure, we have a lot of energy that's leaving associated with that. And so that's important to have an energy recovery device. But if we're talking about compressing a essentially incompressible fluid, um, the PDV work when DV is almost zero is minimally small. So we don't really need any um, brine energy recovery to get these high efficiencies, which saves us on capital costs overall. So we get these great savings. Um, this work has received um, some nice news coverage and invitations to compete in these tech idol type competitions, which has been nice and some awards. Um, and I'm currently working to commercialize it with several companies, um, looking with um, uh, Gradient, which is an industrial wastewater company. Um, uh, it's actually a startup that emerged from my PI's lab at MIT about uh, six years ago. Uh, and they're about a 40 person company. We have a startup, um, which is new out of our lab, which is working to commercialize uh, one design for this technology. And then we have a lot of interest from uh, world leading companies, including IDE, who's the world leader in desalination who wants to help us with a pilot. And now that we've, I've just filed the international version for this patent, I can proceed uh, with that as well. So, We've covered the system level improvements. Well, what about with nanomaterials? So let's take a look at the membrane module itself. Can we improve these membranes overall? I've been doing work now at Harvard with ultra permeable uh, reverse osmosis membranes. Now, unfortunately, this work is un uh, still unpublished, and my co-author does not want me to be giving details on this. 
Um, but briefly put, I showed at the beginning this graph that showed the different regions for energy needs. And one of them was the resistance to membrane permeability being an excess driving pressure. If we can increase the permeability, then we can reduce the excess driving pressure and thus overall improve the efficiency. What we can also do is if we have higher flux rates, flow rates of fluid through the membrane, then we can have um, reduced surface area and essentially reduced module size. We can get de more desalination with fewer units. And so uh, this gives us cost savings. It gives us energy savings from less overpressure. Um, also, graphene membranes compared to polymeric membranes, which are not chlorine tolerant and thus have major biofouling issues, these graphene oxide membranes can be very um, chlorine resistant. And I'm also looking at using these high flow membranes to remove emerging contaminants. Um, so I'm looking at um, how the impact of the chemical properties of these membranes impacts the overall performance, looking at doing characterization studies, so looking at oxidation ratios, looking at um, how different parameters and how helpful they are, how different ways to characterize graphene oxide is relevant for uh, using these for uh, any purpose, including desalination. Uh, so this is more fundamental graphene oxide studies. Um, and then looking at graphene oxide membranes for perfluorocarbon uh, and PFOA uh, rejection, which are very tenacious. The, the uh, fluorine carbon bond is very, very hard to break down in the environment and makes it a very challenging contaminant to deal with. So I've covered energy in water, both through thermal processes and through mechanical processes, to represent the overall scope of uh, the field of challenges with energy use and water technologies. I'm going to now briefly talk on using uh, optimizing energy in food, looking at food refrigeration. To do this, I'm going to compare um, relating water stress with um, food challenges. So here's a map of global water stress, and this is a projection through 2030. Um, looking at water stress. Now, water stress is a metric referring to do these areas throughout the year have enough water to meet their needs? Uh, and we actually find that globally, around half the world's population lives that in areas where they're using all or almost all of their local renewable water, which is their net rainfall. So California is one classical example that has now draining all their reservoirs, but much of the Midwest as well are using groundwater to supplement all their river water they're getting. The Colorado River Colorado River is almost entirely used up, essentially not running to the ocean. And so there are actually a lot of regions in the world that are using up most of their available water. And especially as we have large trends in food, especially population growth and shifting to more meat, we're having more and more stress from agriculture and water use. It's also important to note economic water stress. So these are areas that lack the infrastructure to capture all the water that they need, um, and are especially located in developing countries that aren't using all the water that's available to them through the rain cycle. And you'll see, compared to food, the food stress or the food hunger burden, these maps have a lot of similarities. So looking at that, a lot of the regions are similar. So I'm going to flip back and forth once or twice. What are the similarities between these two? We see that a lot of these same challenges are located, are located in the same region. So this trop these tropical regions um, and the arid regions are both major areas for both food and water stress. In the, for one reason, this is obvious. The main ingredient to produce food is water, and most famines are related to water scarcity or droughts. We hear droughts is the common cause. And actually, right now, in the, if you've been following the news the last week, it's been announced as a new civil war uh, in South Sudan, which people are concerned could actually have the same type of impact in terms of lives lost as Darfur. And, um, this is related to drought and war related to um, oil resources again. So water, energy, food is the type of nexus where a lot of lives, unfortunately, are lost. It's an important area to study. So we have the, that relationship between water and drought and food. We also have the fact that in these tropical regions that are very humid, we have rapid food rot. So high humidity plus high temperatures makes food rot rapidly. And in the developing world, we have this major challenge that power is often intermittent. So in, let's say, Africa, a lot of the new emerging power supplies are all solar-based. And in places like India, there's a shortage of overall power supply, so they have set hours during the day in many regions where they're turning the grid on for, let's say, work hours and turning it off at night. Well, if you can only refrigerate half the time, your food's going to still rot, so no one bothers to refrigerate. And there actually isn't a cold chain in, uh, in these countries, so they're losing 30, 35% of their food just to rot because of the lack of cold chain. 
And it means when you're going shopping for food, it's not like there's US supermarket where we always have apples and tomatoes and onions, right? Their food supply is related to whatever came in that week, because otherwise it's going to rot rapidly. And this relates to food price spikes. And so a major problem is you have a small scale local shortage. Food, the prices of food will spike rapidly. And then you have food increasing by a factor of three or four. If you're in these subsistence level areas, you have people spending half their income on food. If the price of food multiplies by three, you're going to go hungry that week. So to address this, if we could use better refrigeration that would help, that would actually work in intermittent areas, that could help solve the problem. So I've co-founded a startup called Coolify. And we're making um, refrigeration units for developing world applications, so with standard food crates um, for storing vegetables, so one can have like a village level food storage system. Uh, curtains for insulation, so it's a nice thermal design. And um, having different chambers with these curtains that are isolate them from one another, which allows for someone to, let's say, enter one region and not cause heat to spread to the others to reduce overall heat loss. Uh, but the real innovation here comes from a way to be using constant power, constant refrigeration over the course of the day. And so this is a packed bed of one of these cryogel phase change type balls. Um, and what these are is uh, it's essentially a packed bed of small uh, spheres of plastic containing water. And these will each will freeze when you have power. And so you're, f you're using your power both to refrigerate and to freeze when you have plentiful solar power or a, a turned on grid. And then at night or when the grid is off, you um, run a glycol solution around this packed bed and melt these, melt these uh, cryogel type uh, balls. That's the brand name for them. Um, and that allows you to provide continuous refrigeration um, even when you only have intermittent power. And the simple uh, explanation here is batteries are a lot more expensive than ice, right? And the competition for one of these, so the units that we have right here, this prototype, uh, is around $10,000 plus another $2,000 for the refrigeration system with a cryogel. Um, a battery bank that was large enough for this type of system would be about $22,000. So we're having a 20% price increase instead of a doubling of the price, which makes this technology a feasible way to continuously refrigerate in developing world applications. And there's some interesting um, types of scientific problems in terms of um, phase trains, heat transfer, uh, looking forward, other applications on different phase changing materials, better thermodynamic system design, um, and optimization of having a good heat transfer and good fluid flow rates for a um, freezing packed bed design. Um, so with that, I wanted to kind of go into future ideas and plans. Um, my aims are kind of to marry thermal fluids and nanoengineering and look at several areas, looking at thermodynamic system design, uh, enhancing transport, um, including through nanoengineering type techniques, memory nanomaterials, um, studies for membrane fouling, uh, also looking at selective solute removal, which is a major emerging challenge and great research area, and then also integrate, integrating um, renewable energy and water treatment uh, into the same system, which is one of the main driving thrusts right now, both for funding and for um, environmental reasons to make these energy intensive processes renewably powered. And there are a variety of potential collaborations here that I could, would like to take advantage of with faculty who study multi-phase flow, coatings, carbon nanomaterials, mechanics and fatigue for these uh, varying pressure membranes, um, and ag applications, uh, water resources, solar uh, renewable type of faculty, and many other areas. I'm also a big believer in you don't just leave your technology in the lab and once, you're, once your paper is accepted, you know, clean your hands of it and say, okay, accepted, I'm done, right? I think if you're trying to make a big impact, you should try to bring these technologies into the real world and try to help commercialize them. Um, and so I would love to have a lab that licenses a lot of IP. I have more patents than publications right now. Uh, and so I'm a big believer in getting um, technology invented, created, and eventually licensed. And I would also like to have grad students leave the lab after doing their PhD research on a new technology and leave it with this as a, make it a startup company. Um, and that can be done with resources with the business school and through um, various licensing to various companies that I'm, I've, as I mentioned, I'm already uh, working with. I want to briefly mention, we have to, to have a nice big lab that I want to have, we have to fund uh, such a lab. Um, I've had the 
I've raised a bit of money so far, um, and I've had the f good fortune of working with a variety of different funding sources already. A handful of these I was the primary author on, and the others I was fortunate to be funded by or partnered with these grants. Um, and there's a few different categories here and future funding sources I plan to use. And um, federal categories are one. There's obviously a big push right now from the US government and the NSF to fund a lot more water and water energy type research. There's also um, university level funding. Um, there are uh, institutional level funding. There's foreign governments, which is actually a very uniquely uh, effective source for um, water research in general. A lot of countries treat their water research budget like the uh, our US government treats as our NIH budget. Um, so there's a lot of funding, and um, my, my former PI's lab over at MIT um, was largely funded by foreign government grants, mostly through Saudi Arabia and Abu Dhabi. And there's also industry funding that I've been working with currently uh, and plan to have collaborations with as well. So overall, I've discussed um, looking at nanomaterials for improving uh, the water and energy uh, nexus. I've looked at uh, coding improvement for improving uh, desalination technologies and reducing fouling. I've looked at energy efficiency and novel uh, configurations for desalination and the nexus of, of food and energy. I've also been doing a lot of other work in these areas, including some that integrate all of them, such as ground energy for groundwater pumping for agriculture, which is very relevant to developing world applications that get a lot of their water from groundwater. Um, disinfection technologies with new power sources, and um, looking at specific uh, contaminant removal from water to improve agricultural yields, uh, and then other memory technologies. I want to acknowledge my funding sources and my, my lab and my great, ar my great ar army of uh, undergrads and grad students who really do great work and I've been a, have a privilege to work with. So, have I answered this question? Can we save lives with thermodynamics? We have ability to reduce emissions. We can help refrigerate where we couldn't before. We can disinfect water. We can provide water to produce more food through agriculture. And we can use these membrane processes to reduce toxins in water. So, with that, any questions? Yeah, um, so with the coolified refrigeration units, have you, is there any potential for, you know, miniaturizing those so if they could work at the household level? Yeah, so yeah. Food is lost in, in individual refrigerators, right? Um, and so that type of storage that you were showing us is actually, you know, it requires this, at least from what I saw, it requires a certain scale. So, you know, food loss is by and large you're at the house, household level. So have you looked at mini, you know, miniaturizing the whole process? Yeah, we think we can get these down to the size of a traditional refrigerator. Um, it, needs, it will need a little bit more space because you have to have this extra vessel for storing the um, phase change material. But yeah, it's very feasible because it's essentially taking a refrigeration cycle and just adding a, a thermal storage mechanism to it. So you just an, an extra tank. Uh, the number of components are roughly the same. There would be a little more control mechanism, just because you have to say, okay, turn it off, turn, run this when it's off. Um, but you know that's not anything more complicated than a household thermostat. So scaling it to household level size should be pretty feasible. When we first were looking at this problem, um, I was I've been working with this really brilliant guy named Rajat Sethi, who is a entrepreneur from India, who um, came to Harvard and MIT for a joint degree after selling his first company, uh, and he's the CEO for it. Um, and we looked at a few areas, we looked at truck refrigeration, and we looked at different levels of scale before we decided that this was the right level given what the, what the current market infrastructure problems really are. But what about cost? Like, yeah, for the smaller scale. Yeah, for the small scale, um, that cost ratio, though, 20%. Will increase a little bit. It might even get up to 35% increase in cost compared to conventional refrigeration. Um, but that's still manageable, especially if the alternative is batteries, right? Which is just an astronomically large increase in cost, especially with the replacements you would need and all that extra effort. So, yeah, I think it's fairly feasible to scale it to household levels, and that would be a future interest. Um, but the cold chain itself is, I think, the first target market, especially because you have a culture in these places where. They're used to not having reliable refrigeration, so they're used to just consuming it once they get the food. 
Um, so in terms of the, the entry market point, I think the village level, you know, infrastructure scale is probably a better uh, point. Question. So, so for the first part of your talk, the membrane uh, dissemination, uh, uh, is your work mostly experimental or is there any uh, computation uh, kind of work uh, also involved? Sure. So my membrane installation work is around 55% computational and 45% experimental, roughly. You, you, you didn't present any, right? Yeah, um, I presented one, I, I showed the model briefly, the computational model cell, and I showed one graph where I had both the model results for gained output ratio versus, so the efficiency versus flux curve frontier. That's a full system model result. Um, I have a lot of backup slides on that. We have done some really cool work on modeling, including non-dimensionalizing memory installation for the first time uh, as kind of a heat exchanger type framework. Um, but uh, given that this is a nano engineering type um, recruitment here, I decided to focus on the experimental stuff that was more related to nano. So uh, just another question. I, I, I didn't require if you present the uh, water recovery ratio of the memory technology. Sure. Yeah. Great question. So per pass, it's roughly on the order of, well, let me, let me back up. You can get similar recoveries to, you can get high recoveries without significant energy inputs compared. So the, the recover, energy, you can go to very high recoveries with these systems. It just takes multiple passes, but the energy needs fairly follow the same. They don't change a lot if you want to go to higher recovery um, for thermal processes. And they behave a lot differently because they're evaporative process. So instead of having your pressure really ramp up with higher salinity, um, you're just ev evaporating water and recondensing it. So you, um, even if the, le the least work might increase a lot at higher salinities, but the energy for thermal process does not change as much. So thermal processes tend to be much better for the more saline processes. Um, if you want to see some backup slides on, on the type of modeling, I got a nice collection um, back here. Uh, da, da, da. Here's our modeling details for the feed side, the air gap side, the cooling side, the feed modeling, and then all the, the non-dimensionalist framework that we've developed for heat exchangers, and then looking at different new efficiency parameters and old ones, um, if you want more details there. But this is a good, nice salinity graph looking at the air gap I, I, produce, I discussed, which is the best technology at high salinities. And this is compared with the experiment. You, you did experiment yes. And you say yes. You know, Sapphire window and all these. So the, the, the experiments are all validated models. with this. And I, the slides I showed earlier had models. When I showed the curve by, by, by the temperature, those all had modeling curves with it. So. Uh, Professor Wassinger, Dr. Wassinger, soon to be Professor Wassinger, uh, this question is uh, at the sophomore level. Sure. And uh, you mentioned uh, PDV integral a few times, and uh, then you also mentioned this is a constant volume system. And uh, so could you clarify on that if PDV integral is uh, there and it's a constant volume system, then doesn't change volume, so that integral is identically zero, but then there's significant work requirement in this system. And a lot of our students, and I, I just became one, I'm, I'm saying, I really am confused about these uh, BDV versus BDP integrals. So I just want to hear how you would address this sophomore student. Sure. So when I'm describing these things, I'm trying to describe, when I was saying PDV, what I'm trying to convey is that our energy needs for these systems are a result of applying high pressures to fluids that are, ha that are flowing in and out of a system. Um, so let me go to the modeling slide. So if you're looking at these types of systems, um, I think the easiest way to explain it is just looking at the classical reverse osmosis case instead of the batch case, because the batch case is quite a bit more complicated. Um, uh, da, 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 just taking a second to find the slide. Right, so this is, a, this is a map essentially of the energy needs for desalination. Um, so we have our work for reverse osmosis being a function of the osmotic pressure uh, of the exiting brine. So this is the supply pressure. 
And so this, this area actually under this curve, these, each of these areas is the energy needs from a different component for the overall process. And this recovery ratio gives you a sense of what the volume that is actually um, exchanged is. And so this is what I mean, pressure versus your um, fraction of water desalinated. Um, and this gives a good context for understanding um, the energetics for desalination with reverse osmosis. So if someone were to say, I have 10 megapascals pressure drop, or, or let's say 20 bar pressure drop in the system, and its volume is not changing that much, would you be able to give them the rough of the thumb, uh, of the back of the envelope that were estimated? Yeah, so um, the, you're looking back at the batch type system. Or, or a flow type system, actually. So, so let's say we have a continuous flow type system. Um, so when we give a given pressure, we're typically going to give this, we're going to prescribe this pressure right here. Mm -hmm. And we're also going to have to prescribe the recovery ratio, um, which gives us a fraction of what fraction of the water is on it. Because we're, we're pressurizing the entire bulk solution. Um, on the simplest level, if you imagine a recovery ratio of, um, uh, and this is, so this is normalized per unit of, of permeate produced. On the simplest level, if you wanted to only pressurize it, um, just pressurize a large volume of fluid and never desalinate it, then it's uh, you know, a very, very simple result that they could think of and relate to their, their classics. Um, once, then you're looking at, OK, well, what I really care about is the pure water produced. So let me normalize it by pure water produced and then break it down by different contributions of where this energy can and cannot go compared to the least work. Thanks. that you mentioned um, relies on membrane and its efficiency. And you, uh, your premise of your talk was on uh, nanomanufacturing or nanotechnology related. Uh, what sort of uh, innovations that you were thinking about introducing into the membranes to enhance their efficiency? Sure. So when we're talking about membrane specific, in specific for um, nanomaterials, um, I briefly covered new membrane coatings for reducing membrane fouling. Um, membrane fouling not only relates to replacement of membranes, but also provides an extra resistance for the, f the flux through a membrane process. And thus, we need higher driving forces to overcome the membrane fouling. So by using, let's say, super hydrophobic coatings on these membranes, we can um, improve the overall um, energy of performance of the whole system, as well as increase the lifetime of the membranes. Now, I didn't go into the graphene oxide work because it's unpublished, but the idea there is that these membranes can have incredible membrane permeability on the order of three orders of magnitude higher than polymeric membranes. And so what that's getting to is it's chopping away this orange block here, um, and especially synergized with batch processes, offers potentially the best efficiencies we've seen for desalination to date. And so the premise behind these, these type of d d new memory materials, um, and you can imagine, let's say, graphene oxide plates, plates between each other with a uh, spacing of several angstrom. Um, if you have layers of water traveling through, let's say that are three or fewer um, molecules in depth, you get really interesting novel types of transport. It almost sometimes behaves like an ice crystal. And you get really, you get slip flow, and you get really, really rapid tr uh, transport. Uh, it's good work for, let's say, molecular dynamics modeling. So make these membranes, though, while they're very promising, are quite far from, let's say, industry production. In fact, no, there's so many challenges that are left to do that. Um, so one area is better mechanisms of bonding these membranes so they're more robust. Um, another is hierarchical structures so they can deal with higher pressures. Um, um, another is um, trying to avoid clever ways of avoiding of holes that are causing leak through the system, such as through interfacial polymerization to try to block holes. So there's a lot of areas to realize these very p promising membranes that are super far from commercialization. Okay, let's thank this speaker once more. Thank you very much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here.